the American government is based upon federalism. Let's try to figure out exactly what federalism is. And we have a definition of federalism that I want to share with you. Federalism is the sharing or mixing of power between a national government and the state governments. Can each one of those states have has its own government? And each one of those states is divided into sub-governments. Every city and town in a state has its own governmental structure. That's the whole idea of the confederation. That's the lower level government. So the states are like the lower level government. Okay? The unitary government is what we refer to as a national government or the federal government. So if somebody is talking about the national government, they're also talking about the federal government. Okay, that's American federalism. Okay, so every single state in the United States has its own government, and the federal government is mm, the government. The two types of federalism that we're looking at is some call dual federalism, and the other type of federalism is cooperative federalism. Dual federalism begins at the founding of America. So dual federalism comes into existence when the Constitution comes into existence, okay? And so dual federalism comes into existence in 1787. The Constitution is written. And dual federalism will last until 1937. By 1937, dual federalism is out and collective federalism is in. So what is dual federalism? How does it work? Well. Federalism operated this way. You have the federal government over here. And the federal government has its power. The federal government has the things that the federal government is doing. Then you have the state governments, and they're over here, all eventually 50 of them. Okay? And so the state governments are doing their thing over there. So the federal government is over here doing its thing, and the state governments are over here doing their thing. Federal government has its own sphere of influence in which it operates, and the state governments have their own sphere of influence or ways in which they operate. And never the same journey. Until he started going to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court started saying, you know what, we think the federal government should be controlling this. We think the federal government should be controlling that. Under the second theory of federalism, known as cooperative federalism, the national government, state government, and local government interact uh, cooperatively and collectively to uh, solve common problems. Okay. So here's how cooperative federalism differs from dual federalism. Cooperative federalism comes into existence, as I told you, around 1937. And it comes into existence because of something that happened in 1929, uh, something called the Great Depression. Okay? And the Great Depression isn't a bunch of people being sad. The Great Depression was a stock market crash. It began with the stock market crash of 1929. And what happens after that is millions of people in America find themselves unemployed. They don't have jobs of people, millions of people become homeless as well. And so there is a, a president who was elected in 1932, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR. He has this thing that he's calling the New Deal. And so he is going to use the federal government to get Americans back to work. And so Americans are going to be now, at this point in time, being employed by the federal government. And so he really implements this whole idea of the federal government taking control. Okay? And so with FDR in office, the federal government becomes a little bit more powerful than the state government. And cooperative federalism works like this. Roosevelt, New Deal, getting people back to work, getting Americans back to work, uh, making sure that legislation are passed, laws are passed, would help Americans. For example, Social Security came out of this. The FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, that protects your money in a bank, 
okay, up to $250,000, that's all that also comes out of the new deal. When it comes to cooperative federalism, the federal government really has a lot more inducement, okay, money. Okay, so the federal government can get the states to do what the states may not want to be doing, but the federal government, because it has money, because it has influence, okay, can get the states to do other things. Have you ever wondered why the voting age is 18? But the drinking age is 21? Doesn't make sense, does it? But it does if you understand federalism. Um, in the 1970s and the 1980s, the federal government pushed the states to enact uh, a drinking age of 21. And so the federal government said, hey, states, you want some money? We got billions of dollars, millions of dollars that we can give to you. And so if you raise your drinking age to 21, we're going to give you a whole bunch of money. And you know what the states did? They raised the drinking age to 21. So let's look at the delegated powers of the national government, the federal government. Go to the powers that are found in the federal constitution, okay, that gave the federal government the power to do certain things. And most of the powers that the federal government have are found in Article 1, Section 8 of the federal constitution. The federal government can declare war. The federal government can create and maintain the armed forces. That's the army, the navy, the air force, the marines, the coast guard. Okay, those are under the control of the federal government. Uh, the federal government can establish foreign policy. The federal government can regulate interstate commerce. That's I N T E R. Interstate. Inter means between. Okay, so between the states, commerce is business. Okay, that's the power of the federal government. Also, the federal government can um, make copyright and patent laws, okay? and the federal government can establish post offices. The federal government can coin money. Yes, the federal government can make money. There is something known as the Federal Reserve Act, it came into existence in 1913. It talks about the federal government being able to do income. Those are the delegated powers. If you look at Article 1, Section 8, you'll see a lot more, but those are the delegated powers that the federal government, the national government, have. Okay, let's look at something called the reserve powers that the states have. And some of the reserve powers that the states have are as follows. The reserve powers that the states have, the, the states can, establish their own government. Now, every state has its own government. The head of the government in a city is the mayor. The head of the government in a state is the governor. States can establish and maintain their schools. Uh, states can regulate trade or business inside the state. That's intra, I-N-T-R-A. Intra means within. So intrastate commerce, commerce, business inside the state. States can regulate. Uh, states can conduct elections. It is the states that you know conduct these elections and such. Okay, and states can provide for the public safety. Now, when states provide for the public safety, that's part of their police powers. Now, police powers have nothing to do with the police. Police powers are the powers of the state to regulate for the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens of those states. Where is federalism located in the federal constitution? Well, maybe you asked, I will tell you. If you look at the one section eight, we have the Commerce Clause. So the Commerce Clause is one example of federalism in the federal constitution. And the Commerce Clause is really powerful. Okay, so that's one example. Another example of federalism is, is the Elastic Clause. Um, under Article 1, Section 8, Clause number 18, I'm going to read it right now, it says, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper. 
Another example of federalism that is found in the United States Constitution that I want to reference to you, it's the supremacy clause, Article 6, uh, clause number 2. Okay, it talks about the Constitution and all laws made pursuant there are uh, the supreme law of the land. So essentially, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. So, supremacy clause, supreme law of the land. So the next aspect of federalism is also found in the Constitution. So Article 4, Section 3, new states can be added to the Republic, added to, added to America. So that's the fourth iteration, the fourth example of federalism in the Constitution. Fifth example is also found in Article 4, Section 4 says, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government. Now, Republicans in the room, it's not talking about you. Okay? A Republican form of government means that we, citizens, elect other citizens, we vote for other citizens to represent us in government. That's what a Republican form of government is. Citizens voting for other citizens to represent them in government. That's a Republican form of government. Okay, so that's the fifth way in which federalism is located in the federal constitution. Now, the sixth way in which federalism is located within the constitution well, is the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment says, uh, the powers not delegated to the United States by the constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively. Okay, so. If you have ever heard people talk about states' rights, that's what they're talking about, the Tenth Amendment. Okay, states have rights. Okay, and so the Tenth Amendment is the sixth way in which the uh, federalism is highlighted in the Constitution. So we have the Congress Clause, we have the Necessary and Proper Clause, also called the Elastic Clause, we have the Supremacy Clause, we have the Admission of New States. We have the establishment of a republican form of government, and we also have number six, uh, ten men. So those are the six ways in which federalism shows up in the Constitution. 